Welcome to this edition of Shadow the Scientist. My name is Jamika Marshall, and I serve as the STS coordinator. The Shadow the Scientist initiative is housed under the CREST Creating Equity in STEAM, in STEAM umbrella of programs offered by a team at the University of California at Santa Cruz. In this session, we have the privilege of shadowing the crew of Expedition 402 on board the Georgia's Resolution Research Vessel, currently in the Tyrrhenian Sea. The Georgia's Resolution is a seagoing research vessel that drills core samples and collects measurements from under the ocean floor, providing scientists with a glimpse into the Earth's development. JOIDES is an acronym for the Joint Oceanographic Institutions for Deep Earth Sampling, which represents the original partnership of universities that sought to explore the geology beneath the ocean floor. Today, the ship is used by scientists at hundreds of universities around the world. Data from the Jordi's ocean drilling offer a scientific means of understanding climate and environmental change throughout a significant part of our planet's history, a research subject often termed Earth's paleoclimate. The Jordi's core samples are the smoking gun in evaluating many historical events related to paleoclimate, changes in the solid Earth, and more like the extinction of the dinosaurs and plate tectonics. Our guide for this session is onboard outreach officer, Larkin Bone. Welcome Larkin. Hello, thank you so much for that amazing introduction. You covered so much about the wonderful things that Joydees offers, uh, offers to the science community. And this is a really special tour for me because it's one of the last ones. We've been on board now for almost two full months. So we're entering our last week right now. And yes, so I, um, I haven't, we're off the coast of Italy right now, but I say off the coast very loosely because I have not seen land for almost two months now. So it's an exciting time. But, but a little bittersweet because uh, because this ship is so special. As Jamika explained, it has offered so much to the science community and the crew and the scientists on board are all, uh, we just have a lot of love for this ship. So um, I'm excited for this tour today. So I'll just jump right into it. Um, why are we here in the Tyrrhenian Sea? So to understand why we're here in the Tyrrhenian Sea, first we need to know a little bit about the mantle. And I'm gonna give you all a really, uh, a really easy metaphor we like using food in science to explain things. So I'm going to explain the mantle much like, um, like a chocolate chip pound cake, okay? So the, the reason I use the chocolate chip pound cake is because the mantle has many different minerals in, inside that all melt at different temperatures, much like this pound cake with chocolate chips in it. So if you took the cake and you put it into a microwave and heated it up for a minute, when you pulled it out, the chocolate chips would all be melted, but the nuts and the fruit and the cake would all still be intact. That's much like the mantle axe. So when you have things like the tectonic plates opening or a volcano, the magma coming through, that's our chocolate chip sauce. And then when it cools on the sea floor, that becomes basalt. Um, so that's normally what happens. But what's interesting about the Tyrrhenian Sea and one of the reasons we're here is because instead of the tectonic plates just opening and parting like they normally do, um, they are it's splitting. So it's not two tectonic plates moving apart, it's one that has split so much it actually it started to stretch out about 10 to 15 million years ago it started stretching almost like a taffy to where it became so thin that it tore and through that tear some of that intact mantle has has come it's we've been able to uh to retrieve it or we've used seismic evidence to tell that it is here right and a w way that you can think about that is um Another way to speak of the mantle is like bread, okay? So the mantle has all this heat in it, right? All this heat that wants to rise up and come out. But because of that crust protecting and keeping it down, um, it's not able to come through. So what has happened since that taffy, that tear happened, like think of it like the bread wanting to rise, there's, it opened up so that, that that mantle could come through. So it's come through. Now, the other reason that we are in the Tyrrhenian Sea a lot of our oceans, like the, like the Atlantic Ocean, the Pacific, they are older oceans. They're around 145 to 150 million years old. They're old. 
which means there was a lot of sediment deposit. Now, sediment deposit can be anything from like the dust clouds. I don't know if you all know about the dust clouds that are going over right now in Europe, but um, it could be like the Sahara dust. It could be decomposing sea creatures. Many things lead to this sediment deposit. And so over years, that builds you layer and layer and layer and layer. Now, after 150 million years, we've got a lot of layers to go through, right? So, but the Tyrrhenian Sea only is 10 to 15 million years old. So that's a lot less sediment to go through. Another example of, um, of thick sediment versus uh, thin sediment here in the Tyrrhenian would be if you were in New York City, you would have about 30 kilometers of sediment to drill through to get to the mantle that we want, right? But here, you only have 300, 300 meters. So that's a big, big difference. So those are the reasons why we are here, okay? And I just wanted to show you all a little map. I'm gonna switch it around so you can see. So here is where we are. This is Italy and there's um, Sardinia and Corsica. And so years ago, this area, I've got to use my hands. I'm a hands person. I'm a hands person, I got to use my hands. Okay, so, so think about this. We have Italy, the boot, and Corsica over here. So I'm gonna put it like this. They were like puzzle pieces, right? but they split apart and then that split, that's where, that's where that mantle, that what we want is, right? So that's where we are in the scheme of things. Now it's still dark outside right now because it is, the sun is still, it's still peeking its head out. It's not quite up yet. So I'm gonna show you all some examples of, um, of what I'm about to show you when it gets a little bit lighter outside. Um, so one thing that we do is we have a, a drill string. Actually here, I got a picture, a picture in the meantime of the ship that we are looking at. So this is our beautiful Joides resolution. And as you can see, we have a tall derrick. That derrick is about 200 feet up, right? And then um, underneath it is the drill string. And I've got some other pictures to show you all. Oh, that's me again, hi. <laughs> Let's see, do, 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 that I wanna share with you. <laughs> so you all can get an idea of what the ship looks like also under the water, because that's important to understand. Here we go. All right, so as you can see in our beautiful illustration here, we have the Joides resolution, and then you can see coming through under that derrick is a long drill string that's connecting to the sea floor. And then off to the side, you'll see a circle, uh, like a, a circle box with the, uh, with, a, it's with the drill piece inside. So that's connected to the very bottom of that drill string. Now, what's amazing is how do we have this, this drill string is not to scale. That is 3,500 meters. So about 11,000, 11, I don't know, 800 feet down. That's really far down. We're talking over two miles down, right? So how do we keep that ship stable as well as how do we keep that drill string going, going down? How do we keep it all in place? That's a great question. <laughs> so in order to explain that, I'm gonna talk about something called dynamic positioning. And I might walk outside and see if we can get, if it's a little bit lighter out there right now. So I can show you all what is called a thruster pod. So here we go, we're going through the hallways of the Joides Resolution right now. There's my office, stepping outside, still looks pretty dark out here. Okay, but it is light enough where I wanna show you these guys. So this is a thruster pod, right? And then another one over here, thruster pod. Okay, now, see if I can switch this back to me. And I'm gonna put you all somewhere where I can use my hands because I like to do that so much. Okay, so, there, I think that's good. I've got you all on a staircase right now. All right, so, <laughs> okay. So those thruster pods are like towers, right? They're very tall towers. But when we get to, when, we, when we're going underway, when we're going through the sea, those thruster pods are, are up, right? They're, they're up and out of the water. But when we go, when we get to a location where we want to we want to drill and we stop, right? We don't drop an anchor. Instead, what we do is we drop these thruster pods into the water. They go down into the water, and on the bottom of the thruster pod are two propellers, right? Two props. Now, we have five of those thruster pods on board, and each one of those with those two props. So now we have 10 propellers working in conjunction together to keep us to the same place. Not only that, we don't stop there. We have two more props that are mounted in the back, along with our two main props.
crops, the ones that keep us like going, you know, going under the way. So all together, we had 14 propellers all working together to go keep us going too far forward, too far back, side to side. So it's an amazing system called dynamic positioning. Love dynamic positioning. And it's what allows us to do this amazing work out here. So fun fact, years ago, the first dynamic positioning, oh, here we go, we got an engineer. Engineer hey, alert. Say hi, to, <laughs> say hi to Aloha to Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's one of our engineers on board. Actually, he said, oh, hey. People are starting to wake up. It's starting to come alive around here. All right, so let's see, where was I? Dynamic positioning, yes. A fun fact about dynamic positioning is that years ago, the first time they tried to do this back in the 60s, it was actually a barge. And they had the barge had uh, outboards on it. It was very, it was a very uh, archaic and like it's the first time go. And they actually, they dug, they actually got some sediment collection on that first, that first try, but we've come a long way since then. So I'm going to explain um, below the derrick what you, what you see, like how do we get 3,500 meters of pipe going from the ship all the way down to the sea floor. It's pretty amazing. So in order to illustrate this, I've got, I've got some, I've got some straws because <laughs> I want you to pretend that this, this straw, and don't worry, we actually don't drink out of these. These are reusable. We just use these for, for, um, for this demonstration. So we have, we have our, our drill string. So pretend that this is 33 meters long or about 98 feet long of iron, right? So it's an iron pipe. What we do on the back with that derrick is we have, we have, um, we have, let's see, I think it's 11,000, 11,000 meters worth of this stuff on the back deck, right? Think about how heavy that is, it's wild. But so we have all of these drill strings, but we have to build the pipe, right? We have to build this thing section by section. So what they're gonna do, what I'll show you in a minute, is when we go back on the derrick, they've got, they pretend my hand is the derrick and they have the drill string back here, right? They have a machine that will put the, the tip of the drill string into it and then raise it up. It's called, a, um, it's called a pipe elevator. And they'll bring it up, bring it up, bring it up until it becomes straight up and down. And then when it's straight up and down, they'll send it down, okay? So now this, this little guy is just, this much is above the water, right? But we wanna connect something else to it. So I'm gonna utilize my tape here. They're gonna do that with another string. So they have all these strings waiting. They bring another one up, do the same thing where they make, bring it straight up and down, straight up and down, and they attach them. They use something called a, it's called an iron roughneck to attach this thing. Okay, so now we have more. And the same process just keeps on happening where they're whoop, and they're building. And we're taping and we're building. <laughs> Let's get a little crazy. They're a lot better at this than I am. All right, so before you know it, you have 3,500 meters of this drill string just hanging out on the bottom of the sea floor, right? Okay, so from there, how do we connect that string to the ocean floor? Another great question. It's called a recovery cone, and I've got a picture of that too. So you're probably wondering how do you, um, how do you also, how do you get the, the drill string through the ship? Because is there like a hole in the ship? There is a hole in the ship. It's called a moon pool, and this is our moon pool. Now that was purposely built so that we could use this. It's not like a hole in the ship accidentally. These, it's really cool. Um, it actually opens up. So most of the time when we're underway or when we're not doing operations, these doors, you can barely see them here, but there's doors on the side that are always, they're always closed, right? And this is a the safety area. People make sure that it's closed and secure. But when it's time for operations to happen or when we are currently drilling, when we're actually drilling, the pipe will go through here. So the doors open up and then the pipe, they start building this pipe down this moon pool. Okay, so then another thing <laughs> on top of the moon pool, we're gonna do another share content. Do, 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 do. Let's see, so we got the moon pool and then I wanna show you the recovery cone. Maybe we don't have a picture of that. That's okay. I'll just show you with my hands. Okay, so what ends up happening is there is um, a large cone on the bottom of the, of the, they lower down a large cone down that pipe. So say we get down to, you know, we know, we know where, the, where the base, where the floor is, where the sea floor is. 
So when they get down to right about the pore, they will lower down what's called a recovery cone. And the recovery cone is a huge metal, metal cone shape that has a bullseye basically painted on it. And then after that, after we send that down, we send down what's called a BIT. And that BIT has a camera on it. So we have an operator who is, who is operating this drill string from 3,500 meters up using a camera that's at the end of the drill string. It's wild. It's crazy. And what's even cooler is that on all the monitors throughout the ship, they have it playing. So the scientists and all, we're all like watching, watching the, you know, the operator kind of dangling this, this, this pipe, this little pipe around the, um, you know, the bullseye. And then when he gets it, we're all cheering and we're all happy because we know now that means sediment is on the way. So now you know a little bit about What's gonna, what I'm about to show you, it'll all make a little more sense now. Okay, so I'm going to put on my safety gear because we're gonna go into some safety zones. You guys, we gotta be careful. So we're gonna put our hard hats on and we're gonna put our safety goggles on, our safety glasses. Oh, and I'm gonna actually trade this over to Bluetooth because it's gonna get loud out there where we're gonna be going. So, I, so just once I get the Bluetooth going, I'm going to make sure that you all can still hear me. Okay. Can you, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Does it sound like I'm underwater a little bit? Just slightly, but it's not bad. Okay. 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 Good deal. That just means it's working. Okay. Here we go. I'm going to switch this camera around so you can walk with me. Oh, another thing to note that is, that's really important, I think, is the, this map shows all the different places that we've collected samples around the world. All of those dots are from the last over 40 years of doing this drilling. So here's the whole map. It's an incredible, incredible program. I mean, look at all that, all that information that we've gotten from all over. I mean, here we are, this is down in Antarctica. It's everywhere. So that is the international, the beautiful international drilling program. Here we go. All right, now keep on walking. Okay, as we head outside, it looks like it's getting a little bit lighter out there. The sun's coming out. It's gonna be a beautiful day. So you can see the moon up there. Oh, here she is. Yes, yes, yes. Now, as we go into the safety area, you'll see these yellow and black lines that indicates that it is safety time. And if you don't know what that means, I got a little sign here for you, but we're all good. I've got my glasses and my hair hat, so I'm ready to go. All right, now, here she is. It started the show that makes everything possible. That's our Derek. And then next to her, you can see these white, these white pipes, right? These white long pipes. Now those are called shucks. And inside those, different, I want you to think about this, uh, this drill, like a drill at home. And if you were drilling with, between wood and concrete or metal, you would use a different end for that, right? Much like that, these shucks are like the different ends. So this is like a huge toolbox. This is like a hundred foot tall toolbox, if you will. Okay, so we're heading up. Oh, and another thing to note is at the bottom, we have um, these bottom hole assemblies, right? So here you can see these, they're thicker pipes. They're a little bit thicker than our drill pipe. And the reason for that is, um, so the, all the drill pipes are made of iron and iron is nice and flexible. I had no idea how flexible iron was until I started seeing them, what's called tripping pipe. And that was my straw demonstration earlier. That's what the tripping pipe is, is where you're building that large string. But when they raise up the string, it bends. I mean, it's, it arcs, heavily arcs. So that, so iron is very, very flexible. And that's wonderful because when we're in the water, you want a little flex. You want a little flex because, I mean, the water, the water is like wind, but actually, but even more powerful, right? So you need a little bit of flexibility, but at the bottom, you don't want it to be flexible. You want it to be nice and stiff at the bottom so that it stays in the ground and it holds in place. So think of it, you got the flexi, flexi, flexi for that 3,500 meters, but the last part of it, you're going to have these really sturdy, stiff pipes, and that's the bottom hole assembly. Okay, so now moving on, 
to the camp. Oh, actually, here, let me show you the rig floor. We'll come back to this area. Here's the rig floor. I'm going to give you an aerial shot. Oh, this is wonderful. You all got it. The sun's coming up. Beautiful. Okay. So if you can see here. Okay. So remember how I said there was all those drill strings that were kind of in line waiting to go. They hold them all in an area back, back here behind where this drill is. So you've got the drill strings back there waiting, and then they'll lift them up into a little area that's like a tray. They'll put them in the tray, and then you can't see it now, but up there, there's what's called that the pipe elevator. There's my hands. <laughs> the pipe, they'll put the, the end of the pipe into the pipe elevator, and then they'll raise it up. And they'll raise it all the way up to where it's straight up and down. And then when it's straight up and down, like this pipe right here, like that pipe, they, sorry, it's really hot out here. Um, there's what's called an iron rough net. And that machine over there, there's a, you can't see, but there's a track. They, they pull this machine over and then they'll hook it around the pipe and they will secure it. They'll, they'll screw it in really, really tight. I mean, you want this thing, you want these super secure because you think about it, you have 3,500 meters of this stuff, almost 12,000 feet. They can each pipe needs to be very, very tightly secure, more so than we can hand twist, right? We need something heavy duty. So this guy, our iron roughneck is, He's like, he's like a person, but on, on stairs. He's, he's heavy, heavy duty, right? Very strong. So he comes over, he secures the pipe, then they move him out of the way, and then they bring the pipe down. And then the whole process happens again, where they have the pipe in the tray, they bring it over, they hook it into the elevator, pull it up, straight up and down, they screw it into the, the piece that was like the last piece of the pipe, and then, and then it goes down, and so on and so forth, until you have built a beautiful very secure, very long pipe string. Okay, so now I'm taking you all, like it's gonna be, we're gonna do the sample collection, it's gonna be big, small, down to nano fossils. So here we go. Okay, we're going down the stairs now. What is called, this is four deck, and they call this the catwalk, like little models. Okay, so these pipes up here, you can see these, these, I don't know if you can make that out, but they are long plastic, hard plastic, now those are what is going to be, we are going to, we're going to shoot down our drill pipe, right? So we have, those are kind of, the drill pipe is going to be stationary the whole time. But these pipes we're going to lower down into the water and that's going to collect our sediment, our rock samples, all those things. They're going to, we're going to be able to bring them back up and be these carriers, so to speak. So this is what brings up the setup, right? We have a ton of these on board, a ton of these. And when, when it's time for them to bring the pipe, the, uh, the sample up, they'll bring it up. They'll bring it up over here, and there's going to be five people standing here waiting. Because if you think about it, <laughs> the 30, 30, 30 feet um, or nine and a half meters of rock or mud or sediment or sand, that's heavy. And you're going to need people to carry it. So you have five people standing here waiting to go, and they'll load up the first person. Load it up so that they have to Hard plastic, and it was messy, and it was getting shreds of plastic everywhere. It was 
was just, it was cumbersome. And they wanted something that was going to be the was going to work more efficiently. And so the engineers on board got together and they all came up with, with this. And they actually made this on board. So this is something that is, that is a, a joy resolution original is this guy. Now, that's another cool thing that I want to point out about being on these ships is that you're out here in the middle of the ocean. And sometimes you've got to be creative. You've got to make your own, uh, if, if it doesn't exist yet, or if it does exist and you just don't, you don't have access to it, like I said, haven't seen shore in almost two months, um, you have to make it something yourself. And they have um, items, they have things out here like the 3D printer, we have engineers, we have uh, marine tags, we have scientists, so we have all these, all this brain action happening up here and this creative energy so we can create things and make things um, as, as, as we did out here. I, I love that about this place. Very, uh, do it yourself. Okay, now, next up, we have the different drills, okay? So this red one, as you can see, there's no space in between. This is what we're gonna use when we're drilling through hard sediment, we just wanna make a hole. This is just for the hole. Now, this guy is for, um, so it's got, it's got the drill bits for softer sediment, and as you can see, how the pipe fits inside. So this is a good example of what will happen um, if you just if you just flip this upside down, that's what's happening on the ocean floor. So this guy is drilling, so he'd be like that way. Um, but we shoot this through, and that's how we're able to collect our sediment. And keep in mind, the whole time that they're drilling, there's all this rubble and all this sediment and sand and all these things happening. So they're shooting water. They're shooting water out, outside of these constantly to keep up to flush out the hole and then so that we can get a clean sediment sample. It's amazing stuff. Okay, I catch my breath, I get excited when I get these tours. <laughs> um, we're about to go into the lab, so I'll be able to take off, um, take off this, uh, this hard hat and, uh, and show you all around the beautiful lab. As you can see, there are no doorknobs here. We have these fancy doors that are a little bit difficult, but they keep us safe, they're watertight. Okay. All right, now we are in the lab. Okay, can you, can you still hear me? Yes. Okay, perfect. Okay, so now, now we have, remember how I said that we were gonna take things from big to smaller to smaller down to like nano fossils. Now we are in a different stage of this. Now we have taken it from, we've taken it from the sea floor, we take it to the big 30 foot long pipe, and now we we have a meter and a half, right, that we, we can easily carry into this, uh, into this lab. So the first thing, I'm gonna show you all an example of what that looks like. So here is a core. That's one of our cores that has sediment inside. And it's up in one of these, these trays here. So that is an example of what it looks like. So we'll take it over here and we also, right away we want to engrave them. And this is cool, it's called a, it's a laser engraver. And we load this guy up, it can do four at a time. And the reason it's so important to have this laser um, engraver is because we don't wanna, we don't wanna um, get confused onto where, we, we wanna make sure that we keep everything organized, right? And so labeling is labeling, 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 labeling is so important. And so there's fail safes so much so that we have, we have stickers on, on them, we have, um, and now we have an engraved onto the actual sediment collector, right? We have it on the pipe, so you can't mess it up. It's it's on there now. Okay, then we take it over here, and we have. I'm gonna see. Well, I might see if one of my scientists can tell you all about this this area. Do, 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 do. It's a little walk with me. Good morning. Say hello. Say hello, Hato Hawaii. Would you mind explaining awesome. to them a little bit about physical properties? Awesome. Okay. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Irina. I am a physical property specialist, and I am going to take that sample to do some uh, thermal conductivity on this sample. This is a, a piece of periodotype that's a muscle, a little tongue-nose muscle, that is a little tongue-nose muscle. We also have a uh, 
from those class that is double. You can use your loud outside voice. I, I don't know if they, they don't have the hearing. Uh, okay. Yeah, if you don't mind. <laughs> you want to be louder? Yeah. Or I think so. I think so. <laughs> so, yeah. So, those are different types of books. She said yes. 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 <laughs> they are recovering here. So, I, they, uh, you can see that this one is bad because I was just measuring physical books. I was measuring seismic velocity on that and uh, that I had to do edit. And uh, that is this rope. And this one, before I do any measurement on that, I will have to soak it for four hours. So I have a special container where I will soak it for four hours. So here are my special container, and that's where I put it. And I have this rock that I uh, collect from previous four that is soaking, it's almost ready to go. So within the next uh, 15 minutes, I will put it to the measurement. And I have a little ones. Like these ones, you see? Ah. So they are also soaking and waiting to be measured. Okay, so here we do measure uh, different types of physical properties. Like this instrument here is for seismic velocity measurement. So we do we place a sample right here, and uh, this is a transducer, so that's a source of seismic energy. So it propagates through the sample and measures how fast that wave propagates through the sample. So that is seismic velocity. Here is an instrument for moisture and density measurements. This one actually measures the volume. And we use these scales to measure the mass. So volume, mass will allow us to calculate the density. Perfect. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Alina. <laughs> okay, we're going to keep on moving. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi. This is where we would take these horses. So you can see right here how there are some of these rocks laid out right now. So this is the descriptions area. And those are some of our description scientists over there. What happens is, is we take it to these areas and you can see too, oh my gosh, I missed a step. I got so excited I missed a step. So you can see that these rocks are smaller. How did they get smaller, right? I said big, you know, medium, small. So they come in here and we have, okay, there's people in here. <laughs> we have, we cut, we place the cores into this tray, right? This large tray, and we can cut them in half. So we have what's called a working half and, and an archive half, right? So this is, so now we have, we took it from the big pipe down to a meter and a half, and now we have it in halves, right? Half sections. And I can show you what um, we have, we keep an archive and there's three what we call repositories around the world. There's one in Texas, there's one in Japan, and there's one in Germany. And these, these archives are so cool. Let me show you a picture of this. I, when I got the chance to go to one, it was like, it was, it was the coolest thing. Um, okay, here's a picture. Okay, so th there are walls and hallways full of these sediment, these sediment samples. So each one of those represents a, um, you know, half of a core. And so you think about all the hours that it took to make one of these, you know, one of these cores and you've got hallways of them floor to ceiling and they're refrigerated and it's just, I felt like I was in a, like a Harry Potter movie or something when I was in there. It was so cool just, just being around all that energy and knowing that all the, the hard, uh, hard work that went into each one of those cores and that they will be there for scientists to use for years and years and years to come. And in fact, what's a cool fun fact, um, one of our scientists, he used for his, uh, for his thesis, he got a sample that was from before he was born. So he was able to go get a sample of sediment from a year, like for his, his research before he was even born because of these repositories. That's how important this stuff is. It's so cool to see it in action. Okay, so we're gonna keep on going. And as you can see, these are like, these are like those, uh, those samples that I was talking about. So we have trays of these. So, so half of it will be here and half of it will go into the, the archive. Okay. Then, let's see, Agatha, would you want to? Would you mind telling them a little bit about nanofossils? I have I have some people from Hawaii here, and they would love to hear about what you do. And she's saying hi. Hi, <laughs> hi. my name is Agatha, and uh, I uh, work at the University of Catania, which is uh, in the southern part of Italy. Uh, my role on board is to provide uh, age determination according to uh, a special kind of uh, microfossil, which are called uh, calcareous nanofossils. 
and uh, they are very small, but they are quite powerful because they can provide very useful and uh, specific age determination for uh, segments. Uh, if you want me to show something, I will say yes, that. please. Uh, it's very easy to prepare uh, samples for the analysis because uh, uh, you make uh, this uh, thin section, which uh, you maybe you believe that nothing is inside because uh, these uh, uh, fossils are very small. The size is uh, uh, about uh, 10 microns, and you must consider that uh, um, the uh, one micron is uh, uh, one, uh, um, uh, one millimeter. Uh, the, the millesimal part of one uh, millimeter, which so they are very small. But we have the opportunity to have this uh, very nice uh, microscope, which can uh, have uh, provide uh, magnification of more than 1000 times. And then, uh, if we put uh, this uh, in uh, under the microscope, maybe we can find we can see something like this. I will show you if I found. Something not in age, yes, we have. Maybe we can have this uh, very nice uh, sky with uh, all these uh, stars. You see, uh, we have this uh, very nice, they, they are uh, here, yes, in, the, in this, uh, in this, uh, okay, yes, in this. Yes. If we put uh, under the microscope, we can have these uh, very nice images, which uh, are uh, stars which lived uh, about uh, in a uh, in an ancient uh, sea, which is about three million years old, and uh, maybe if uh, <laughs> yes, it's mm -hmm. amazing. And uh, um, if you want to see something else, okay, I will try to show you. And uh, maybe uh, this one is very nice. It looks like uh, small uh, butterflies, and uh, they are uh, again uh, calcareous nanofossils, uh, which. Uh, provide an age of six million years for this uh, wow. sample. So this is, uh, this is my job on the, on the, on the ship. Was well, because we are at the end, and we are uh, going to finish now, but uh, that was my job on the ship. Thank, Thank you so you. much, Agatha. Thank ciao. you so ciao, much. Ciao. Ciao, ciao. It's incredible seeing, seeing this light, this light so deep in the water. Another one of our microbiologists on board, she's finding evidence of, uh, of sea life that's down kilometers deep. So sometimes you have, they found sea life that is, that is below, below the sediment, like two kilometers below the sediment. I mean, it's crazy. Like how are these, it's not only no sunlight, but we're talking like low oxygen levels. It's wild. So this, this place is incredible. Now, another one, another, um, another area that I want to show you is this, this lab. This is where Agatha works and also, um, Ravi, one of our other scientists. And what he does is he will get, I'm just gonna take this out so you can see, he will take sediment collections and he'll put them through this sifter, right? He has this sifter and then he cleans it. There's a water that comes through this little, it's like a little cleaning system. So it sifts through, puts this fresh water through so that he has um, really clean sediment. And then what he'll do is he'll put it into this dehydrator and it dehydrates until it's like a fine crumble. And then he makes, he also makes the slides and his slides are, so I get to does nanofossils and he does microfossils. And I'm gonna share with you what they are because they're beautiful, beautiful fossils. Okay, let's see. Oh, look at these, here we go. All right, so this is what, um, what Ravi, what I, what I just showed you his lab, this is what he takes pictures of. So if you see on the, um, this is a plankton, this is a, this is a micro, um, this is a magnified plankton, but if you look up in the, um, on the top, I guess like half globe, right? How you see on the top, top left, do you see a little star that's in the middle of one of those, uh, you see that? Okay. Okay. That guy, in fact, here, I'll even circle it. There we go. That guy right there. Okay. If you look at that, that little star, that's what Agatha is looking at. So, so we went, so now we took it from, we had the sediment at the bottom of the ocean floor to the 30 feet, the 30 foot long plastic pipe to the meter and a half to descriptions that you saw that, um, that uh, or to the coring half, where half goes to the repository, half stays here, to um, Arena doing prop, she's, you know, doing the, the net, the waves, and then now down to the micro and nano fossils. So there you go. That is, <laughs> that is it in a nutshell. <laughs>
and I would be happy to take it. Oh, also here, I can, we've still got a few more minutes. I can take you all down to the galley if you'd like and see, and see the, um, see, uh, I said, yeah, okay, here we go. It's always fun to go to the galley and see people. Right. See how we live day to day around here. All right, this is actually pretty cute because I'm gonna get show you all the pet wall because scientists have pets too. <laughs> so they all, everybody misses their animals at home. So we have this wall set up. So every time they leave the lab, they can be greeted by their furry four-legged friends at home. It's really, really sweet. And then on top of that, if you go a little bit further down, do you see all of these different logos? All of these different logos on this wall. Now each one of these logos represents a different cruise aboard the Jordanese Resolution. So we're all on here, each, each expedition is two months long. And at the end of the two months, we, everybody, we end up designing a logo to represent our cruise. And then we all vote on the logo that we like the best. And that gets put onto t-shirts, hoodies. We do screen printing here. So we print them on the shirts. And then we also put them up in this almost like hall of fame of the different expeditions, right? I'm actually gonna go all, we're going all the way down. Okay, here we go, going down to main deck, which is the very important mess hall, the galley, where we eat our yummy food. Okay, so here we have the all important coffee machine. This, uh, this gets a lot, of, a lot of action, this coffee machine. And then next to also is a, is a favorite, the ice cream machine, right? That, so you have ice cream anytime you want it, it can be a little dangerous. Then we have our toast, our, um, our cereal. Something important to note is that this is a 24 hour operation. It costs quite a bit of money to come out here. And so we wanna utilize every single minute we have. So we have two shifts. We have the, um, our scientists work in two shifts. So there, there's always a counterpart. If you have a microbiologist on one shift, you'll have one on the other shift. So then they, and they'll trade off. Um, so we have, noon to midnight and then midnight to noon, right? Those are the, the two ships that we have for the scientists and most of the crew. Now with that in mind, your breakfast might be at midnight. It might not be, you know, early in the morning. So what they have, what they've set up is they feed, they, we do four meals a day. We have um, from 11 to one a.m. and p.m. and then 11 to one p.m. to a.m. And then we also have five to seven and that's both five, five to seven a.m. and five to seven p.m. Right, so we have those four four meals a day, and they're all good. So it's so everybody's taken care of, no matter what shift you're on. But in case you get snacks, in case you're hungry between that, because I don't know about you, but I I get the snacks, I get the mushies. So I if I want if I want a bowl of cereal, say in between those shifts or in between those meal times, they have taken care of that. They make sure we get exactly what we need. So we have our toast, our cereals, ramen noodles, microwave to heat things up. We have all sorts of milk and yogurt, and I love it. They have the oatmeal milk, they've got almond milk, soy milk, all the milks. Then we have tea, you've got your Coca-Cola, your juices. But then here we go, this is another danger zone. Danger zone! They have desserts all the time. So you can, it's always different dessert, always different pies and things. And then here we have, this is the eating area. This is where everybody eats. Now there are 112 crew members on board at any given time. So we can't all eat in here at the same time, but because they have, they serve for those two hours in a row, usually if you come down and it's busy, you can just come back down like 10 or 15 minutes later and it's, and it's nice and nice and calm and you can find a seat. So, and I haven't had any problems. Then we have our fruit and a salad bar. We have soups. We have our beautiful Amy here. <laughs> and then we have cookies and rolls and that sort of thing. Oh, and here is a sample of the stuff that we have for breakfast this morning. So you've got, you've got your savories from the evening, like, you know, dinner style food, but you also have breakfast food as well. It's kind of wild. <laughs> you can get whatever you want any hour of the day, which is great, but also, like I said, dangerous. Okay, so we're gonna go back upstairs and we're gonna go into the office, I think. For any, for any questions that you all might have. Because that I was, was terrible. Incredible, Larkin. Thank you. Um, I'd like to invite 
uh, everyone to, if you have questions or comments, please drop them in the chat um, right now. <laughs> and so that Lassie <laughs> can answer them. Yeah, one of her colleagues to possibly answer them if um, if she is unable to. Um, I I would love to start with um, maybe some some basic things. I I know that um, at you there's so many people on board. You said there's like a, over hundred people on board. Does that include like, yes, like the crew that maintains the ship that like runs the vessel? Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I can show you. It's funny. I just walked by our picture. So here is, we have all of the staff, everybody that's on board here. So up here we have the technical staff. Now these are the, these are the techs and the people that take care of, they're kind of the li liaison between the, um, between the scientists and the deck department. And also they take care of like those labs, like when I was uh, showing you all the core cutting room and things like that. And the people that are waiting to carry that core, those are our marine techs, our lab technicians, right? So they, and there's also people that are in charge of, you know, like the chemistry lab and the different, the different laboratories. And then we also have a computer lab on board. So we have a computer programmer and uh, somebody that's taking care of all of our internet because me being able, like us being able to communicate right now, there, we have to have the different satellites going and making sure that everything is running in working order. So we have all of those people, all of those wonderful people up here on board. And then here is the science party. That's all of us. And we have scientists from, um, from Japan, from India, from Italy, uh, from Greece, from America, from all over the world here. It's really a beautiful international program. We have China, like everybody's here. Everybody's hanging out on the joities. And then down here, we have our interior staff, and they're the ones that are taking care of like laundry, the rooms, um, the cleaning, like all the things that, they, without these guys, like if they keep the ship, really they're kind of the heart of the ship, keeping the, the ship in motion. And then um, literally keeping the ship in motion are these guys, this is the crew and the deck department, right? So you've got everybody from like the captain to, um, to people that are running the CM crew. So we work. We work with what's called CM, CM Offshore, and they're a fantastic group of people, so professional, uh, and they're the ones that are, were able, that are that run the Derrick. So the, a lot of them, they also work in, um, you know, oil uh, oil rigs around around the world, but they've come here to the Joides, and they really like it here because I feel like the Joides is kind of the Trader Joe's of the research world, where it's just really friendly, and everybody's really nice, and it's a very, um, it's a very inclusive environment. Amazing, amazing. Thank you for that. Um, so uh, what about your your medical needs? Um, I, I assume there's a doctor or, or, or two on board? Yes, yes, actually. So we have our hospital right here. And hey, doctor, can you say aloha to the people in Hawaii? There's our friendly doctor. He makes sure that we are all well um because we are out here like we, like for two months and if something were to happen we actually have an extremist machine we have um all sorts of medical equipment that keeps us if, if any if anything were to happen and there's also a helicopter helicopter pad on the back deck so um if there were a crazy emergency there's there's that as well so there are options and then um it's just nice too because like when i first got here i was feeling a little under the weather and it was nice to be able to go talk to the doctor and say, hey, like, I've got a cough. Is this okay? You know, and and it just, it's really reassuring, especially when you're out here. We have to be almost like a um, like a small city. It's like a small city out here. We have everything that, that any town would have. Incredible. Uh, so thinking of, about, uh, you know, the, the things that you need, you showed us the, the gallery. We got to have the good food to keep all this amazing science happening and running the ship to make yes. everything uh, function all together. Um, I I know you bring pretty much everything you need with you because, as you said, you, you have a thing short for for two, almost two months. What about yes. water? Do you, how do you produce your own water? Because you have to yes, drink so much water. Oh my gosh. Yes, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. We have a desalinator. So we actually make our own water on board. 
And um, and actually, Tessa, she made, if you go to our Joydee's Instagram page, she just made a great video walking you through the actual process of us, the desalinator, how it works. So that's, that's a step-by-step. -step. She really gets into it. And it's really informative in just 60 seconds. So, um, but yes, we, we, they do a desalination process. And then they actually do something where they add minerals back in because it's such purified water that it's almost it, like our body... Um, can't process it unless you put these minerals back into it. So, um, so it's very, very clean and uh, healthy water. And all of our water, we have water faucets all over the ship, so you can refill your water bottles. Uh, yeah, they take care of us with the water. It's a very abundant and good water. Amazing. All right, we'll definitely have to check out that uh, that uh, Instagram link. Okay, we have a question from Ruth. Um, are there cooks on board for these? Other, other what for amazing meals that you showed us, cooks or or does or do things come kind of pre made and you, you you set them out? How does that work? Oh no no no, they 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 we have some amazing cooks on board. Yes, um, they are. We actually have a, it's not just cooks, but also we have a baker, a designated somebody who's who's a baker, and he bakes at nine a.m. and nine p.m. every day. So we have fresh bread on board. We have our like you know, like the, the sliced bread that for like the toaster and things, but we have fresh loaves of bread, fresh cookies, fresh everything. Um, and then they also now this is really sweet. Um, they have um, every Friday they do a theme meal, and so like one one week it was French. One week it was, you know, Chinese and, uh, and sometimes you can put a special request. So one of the girls, one of the scientists on board, one of the women, she's from Greece. And so she requested, can we do a Greek day? And they made it happen. They put it, they put it together. And so, yeah, we have different themes every week. In addition to that too, we also do cookouts. We have a huge uh, barbecue on one of the decks. And so we do like a barbecue. Um, one of the things that's really important on board one of these ships, because you are out so long, it's not just the science collection and the food, but it's also like the mental, right? And so you, to have that human connection with people and to have a little bit of um, free time where you can communicate and kind of like let loose a little bit and have fun. So those cookouts provide that where we all can get together at lunch and because uh, that's when the two shifts, right? One is coming off and one is coming on. So everybody's awake at that time and it's a perfect time for everybody to kind of like congregate and just kind of just see where everybody, just hang out and be friends, just be humans, you know, without, without work. It's just, it's really, it's really, really nice. Amazing. That does, that does sound nice. Thank you for that question, Ruth. Um, and in our last two minutes, um, Annalise asked, what are some of the most interesting discoveries from the fossils that you have come across? Oh, wow. Okay. Um, one of them, we found, we found a fossil of a little, uh, it was called a butterfly shrimp, I believe. And uh, those, the last time that this is kind of, it's kind of like, it almost sounds like a scary movie, but the last time they discovered those was back in the 1700s. And it was this, I think it was a, it was either a Finnish or a Danish uh, vessel that discovered these. And when they discovered them, they, uh, they, 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 they discovered these and then they got caught in like the Arabian, something to do with it. They got caught and they caught up and so they got sick. And then they all, they all perished. And so when we got these, it had nothing to do with the fossil, nothing to do with the fossil. <laughs> but when, it, but, when, but when, when they, so every, um, every week we also do a conference. We, we all meet up in the conference room uh, where I was showing you all the map at, at the beginning of the, um, of the tour. So we all meet up there and all the scientists kind of share their different discoveries. Cause remember we have scientists from all different disciplines. We have sedimentologists, paleontologists, microbiologists. And so all of those, I like to think of our science is like what our mission is a mystery, right? And and all of these are different detectives from different departments and they all add in something to that mystery. So when we come together in the conference room, you have all of your detectives kind of coming in and they're saying, well, this is what I found. This is what I found. This is what I found. And so it all comes together. So when she said the fossil thing, though, it was really funny. We we're all like, oh, no. What is what does that mean? Does that is that, is that an omen? Uh, but it was just it just so happened to like you know, that, that was a funny discovery. But we are also finding things like um, what I was talking about earlier, the life uh, being you know beneath the sediment. Uh, so you're not only three thousand five hundred meters down, so twelve thousand feet down almost. Uh, then below that, so you're going like another almost thousand feet, or you know three hundred meters below that, and you're finding these 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 life forms, these like amoebas and these single cell life forms. That it's just it's incredible. It's incredible to find life down there. And what, and what possibilities, the more we understand that, like, what does that mean for us? Like that maybe we could survive in these um, extreme environments. So it's, it's, it's all very interesting. That does sound amazing. 
amazing. Uh, thank you, Annalise, for that question. Um, and so uh, maybe thank just the, the last few questions and just wrap up. I believe this is, um, you will have a few more days left on this expedition. Um, so what are, um, you know, what things are you all doing to prepare to 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 wrap things up? And yes, yes. Head to shore. And then um, I, I would love to know a little bit about um, your your background as the the outreach officer and you know um, uh, other things yeah. that you do on board uh, the ship besides give amazing Perfect. tools. Um, yes. <laughs> okay. Um. So to wrap things up, every department is kind of cleaning house, right? Uh, we're still actively collecting cores up until like the last the last minute that we can, right? So they're still still collecting cores, but in a couple of days we will be cleaning out the labs cleaning out the conference room, cleaning everything out and packing everything back in. Um, and then along with that, all, all the scientists are doing their last final reports where they're summarizing what they've learned. And then in a year from now, they're all get, we're all going to meet up again. So that's the fun doesn't stop right now. I mean, it's, it's exciting um, that in a year we will all be able to meet back up in a different location and then uh, compare notes. Because one of the things that's so beautiful about this ship is having, like, remember I said, all the little detectives, well, they're in, like, they, if they have a question for another detective, they can just go into the next room and ask that, that scientist. If they have a microbiology question, there's a microbiologist right there. And they're all on the same page, working on the same mission at the same time. Whereas um, when we leave the vessel, they will be in India, China, America, you know, Australia, they'll be all over the world working, trying. And so it'll take a while to get those answers. It won't be as, you know, right there at the ready. So we're packing everything up, getting everything ready for to go back to shore. And then um, my personal, what, how I got here is, I, is an unusual story. So my background is a sailor. Um, I started off on, on the Pride of America <laughs> 12 years ago. That was my first vessel. And I started out in the jewelry shop. I was actually working in Chicago at the time. I went to an open house and then they got, I got high. I was like, I want to do something different. So I went to an open house for, for Norwegian Cruise Lines, got on the Pride of America, worked there for two years. Um, I loved being on the ship, but I did not, like the jewelry store wasn't really my thing. I'm more of a hands-on kind of person. And so I saw the deckhands and what they were doing and the mates and the captain. I thought, could I be a sailor? And so I started networking with them. And the next, my next job was as an unlicensed deckhand on an adventure cruise line. So I worked on that adventure cruise line for five years, driving the Zodiacs, giving tours, uh, places like Alaska, Panama, Costa Rica, Baja, Mexico. And, uh, but my heart was always in science. I always wanted to work in the field of science, growing up watching National, National Geographic, Discovery Channel, the Learning Channel, all those things. I thought I want to do that. But, um, but I never thought that I, this is personal, but like, I never thought that I had what it would take to be a scientist. So I didn't go that route, but this was my side door into that world. Right. So I start working on these research vessels and I thought it was so interesting, so beautiful what they were doing. So I started asking them, Hey, do you mind if I film you? I want to show my friends, you know, what you guys are doing. So I started filming them. Um, and they, and it was so wonderful to, to, get questions, like answer their, they would answer my questions very openly. And I was just learning so much. And so the first video that I shared with them, showing them like, hey, this is what I've been doing while I've been following you around like a little weirdo. <laughs> just following you around following you. I showed them the video and they said, wow, how long have you been doing outreach? And I said, what is outreach? <laughs> and they explained it to me. And I said, I can get paid for this? And they said, yeah, you can make a career out of this. And so that's how I ended up starting to, to do outreach. So then I, so then fast forward, I, over the next few years, I'm making little videos on the side for the ships that I'm working on. And this is actually, um, this is, then I met a woman named Emily Estes who worked for the Geordie's Resolution while I was on my last research vessel, working as, as a deckhand and a mate in training, but also doing videos on the side of the research that we were doing. I showed her the video and she said, have you heard of the Geordie's Resolution? And I said, no, what is that? And she said, I think you'd be a good fit. And here I am. 